Romans 8 and 9, if you've been following along in the book of Romans, Romans 8 and 9 give us some insight into into something that is very hard for us to grasp. So it doesn't like tie up all the loose ends, but it gives us an idea of what it's like to be God and how he does things. Now this is really important because you want to make sure that you are on uh, the same page as God is. When I was in college, I I drove a, uh, a truck. What I mean by truck is a, like a one-ton dually with a, like a 25-foot trailer, gooseneck trailer on the back. And I did this for a group, a, a musical group in the school. Uh, and just to be clear, I was not in the musical group. I just drove the truck for the musical group. And my objective was really simple. The, the group was on the bus. And all I had to do was follow the bus. It's a big, white, eagle charter bus. All I had to do was follow this thing around. So for two summers of my life, literally went to like 35 different states from coast to coast, just traveled everywhere. Every day I got up and I just followed, followed the bus. Well, one day we're driving through Arizona. And as we're driving through Arizona, I'm just following the bus. And, and it just seemed like we weren't making very good time. And so I picked up my radio. Of course, we didn't have cell phones. I picked up the radio and I, I uh, called the, the bus driver. His name was Jason. I was like, hey, Jason, could you like step on it, man? We're like going really slow out here. No response. And I waited a little bit later. I'm like, come in, come here, rubber ducky, come on. Uh, you going to do this or what? You going to pick up the pace? And no response, no response. And I started to look at the vehicle that I was following. And, uh, and I started to look, it looked a little bit different. So I sped up, got real close to it. I realized I was not following the bus. I was following an RV that in my defense looked a lot like the bus. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe this RV got in front of us, right? So I I pulled around past the RV, and then I looked at it, and there was just nothing forever. Like, there was nothing out there at all. I drove really fast, thinking maybe I was going to catch up, never caught up to anybody. Turns out, about two hours previous to this epiphany, about two hours previous to that, we were in a place, and uh, he took a right, and I took a left, and I didn't notice for like two hours. So now, now I have to figure out how to get back to where he is, because it doesn't matter where I am. That's insignificant. I have the equipment, but i got to get back to where they're going and where the concert is. And so i got to get to where they are. So luckily, I happened to remember the name of the city that they were doing the concert in. And so I was just like drove like a maniac and was able to catch up with them eventually and pull right back in behind him like I had never been gone, right? <laughs> they knew, but they were like, what happened to Grant? Anyway, so, so that's what we have to do in our relationship with God. See, we... We sometimes get to thinking that we're smart, okay? And hopefully through this message today, you're going to realize that that is true for like nobody in here, okay? But we start to think that we're pretty smart and we know what the right thing needs to happen. And our only question is, why doesn't God do it? I mean, come on, it's not that hard to figure out. Here's what God needs to do. God needs to do this in my life. God needs to do this in somebody else's life. God needs to work. And we're just trying to figure out why God isn't doing the right thing or the smart thing. And really what we should be doing is trying to figure out why God does what he does and trying to understand him. If you don't understand what God is trying to do, I say that a lot, but it's worth repeating. If we don't understand what God's trying to do, then then the Bible doesn't make sense and what God's trying to do in our life doesn't make any sense. So we're going to explore some of the deepest two chapters in scripture and try to understand what in the world it is that God is trying to accomplish. And the first thing we want to do is we just want to look and say, okay, so when God looks at the globe, right, he looks at planet Earth, 7 billion people on the Earth, what is his objective? Romans 8.28, if you've been following along this week, Romans 8.28 shows this really simply. He says, and we know that in all things, now think about that for a second. Think about how big all things is. You know, it's things that happen in your life, it's things that you're connected to, but it's, it's all things. Everything on planet Earth is at God's disposal. He is working all things. God works for the good. He is working in, he is engaged in, he is active in, he works for the good. Think about good for a second. What is good for somebody isn't always perceived as good to somebody, right? What I'm doing for my kids that is good, they don't always perceive as good, but I know it's good. They don't think it's good when I take them to the dentist, right? But, 
but it is good for them. They don't think it's good for them when I discipline them, but it is good for them. Just because we don't perceive it as good doesn't mean it isn't still good. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, here's what we do with this verse. We mess this up all the time. We misrepresent this, we misquote it. You, you might hear this a lot, something tragic happens in somebody's life, and somebody will go, well, man, all things work together for the good. That is not helpful. That is not good. That is not what this verse says, that somehow mystically there's a power in the world that is making bad things kind of work for good things, right? Or maybe we come along as Christians and we add the God element to it, and we're like, yeah, God works all things together for the good. And it doesn't matter what happens. You lose your job, you lose somebody you love, something bad happens in your life, just kind of carte blanche. We're like, yeah, God, God works all things together for the good. Again, not what this verse says. God is not working all things together for the good of everybody on planet Earth. Just to be clear, God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In other words, when God looks at the globe, and he looks at planet Earth, there's only two groups of people. There are those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And for those people, he's working good. And for everything else, there's everybody else. The other bunches and bunches of people, the vast majority of people on Earth who don't love him and aren't called according to his purpose, those people are used for God's purpose, for his good. Let me explain that. Like, you see this happen all the, throughout the Old Testament. Love it. Uh, one example. God's people were super sinful at one point. The Israelites, well, at one point. Pretty much the whole Old Testament is God's people being super sinful. But they were, they were at a point where it was beyond return. And they were, just got to a point where things were really bad. And so God knew that he needed to do something that was good for them. And what was good for them is for him to punish or discipline him in, or, in them in order to humble them and bring them back to his heart and pull them away from their sin that was kept them so far from him. So God did something that was good. He disciplined them. Now, here's what he did to discipline him. He found uh, or raised up a guy named Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. He was like everything. He had all the power and all the influence in the entire world. And God had this guy with power and influence that God had given to him, and he used him like a puppet. And he used him like a puppet to discipline and be good to the people who were called according to his good purpose. All kinds of examples like that. Then you come along, like the book of Ezra. I don't know why, this morning, just this morning, I woke up and I read the book of Ezra. I don't know if that's ever happened in my life. How many people didn't even know the book of Ezra was in the Bible? I won't ask you to raise your hand. But I just like popped open the book of Ezra this morning. Ezra chapter 1. King Cyrus of Persia. It talks about how all power and authority and influence and wealth on earth had been given to him. He was, he was the biggest shot on earth during his time. Chapter 1, it says, and all of a sudden Cyrus just decided that his calling and his purpose in life was to build a temple for God's people. Here's why it's a big deal, because to, to Cyrus, to Persia, the Israelites, God's people, they were nothing. They were insignificant. There was nothing to be gained from this for them at all, but just all of a sudden, God used him for the good of those who loved him and were called according to his purpose. You go into the New Testament, this is one of my favorite things I realized when I, when I went through history. I was looking at Rome, and everybody, you know, talks about the greatness of Rome, how fantastic Rome was, and, and even some of the technology and the things that we attribute, uh, we attribute to Rome. Just great. Wow. Rome was ahead of its time. Fantastic. One of the things that Rome did was they built different trade routes, and they had roads that they would build. And this is what attributed a lot to their greatness. So what they would be able to do is they would be able to get information from one side of the country to the other. They would be able to transport troops from one side of the country to the other, this was a lot of their strength and their power came from these different roads and trade routes that they established. And somebody might look at that and go, oh yeah, man, Rome, they were just, wow, people, smart, powerful, right? But who else used those roads? One day there's a guy by the name of Saul on the road to Damascus. 
And the Lord appears to Saul and he knocks him off his horse. And he appears to him and he says, you are going to be my servant and you are going to proclaim my word to the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? Romans and a lot of the people that lived in the empire of Rome. And so Paul then spent the rest of his life using those trade routes, those roads that had been built by the Romans for their own glory and for their own good. God had established those so the Apostle Paul could go everywhere and tell everybody the message of the good news. Because God, God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Maybe you've even sensed this in your life. Maybe you've even seen this. You've seen God working and doing things and putting maybe you in positions that you like never dreamed uh, you'd be in, right? I had an interesting experience uh, this past week. Uh, they called me up and they asked me to come pray uh, and offer the invocation at the Capitol building in the Senate. And so I was like, cool. I didn't know y'all did that, right? And I can say, like, in Jesus' name at the end? And they're like, yep, yep, you can, you can say that prayer. How many people didn't even know that they prayed at the Senate? I had no idea. So, so I go up there, and I'm walking around. They kind of give us the red carpet tour, and they tour us through the Capitol building. And, and I'm all in my suit. This is what I look like. I was next to Senator Hopgood, who's from Taylor. And then they introduced me to the guy on the left, or on the, you're right, that I had absolutely no idea who it was. Turns out that's the lieutenant governor. He's like somebody. And um. <clears throat> And I was like, oh, okay. So they introduced me to him. And uh, then they take me around the Capitol, and I'm all, you know, in my monkey suit and everything in there. And I'm trying to play the part. I'm like, yes, I'm the pastor. Yes, I'm here. Very important. <laughs> and they're all showing me the Capitol. And they're like, see, in the glass, all 50 states are up in the glass. I'm like, oh, yes, isn't that interesting? Isn't it? <laughs> glass up on the ceiling. But inside, I'm like, shoot, this place is big. <laughs> Woo, we could have church in here. <clears throat> And, uh, and I have no idea, like, what, what's at work there, like, with all those pieces moving. I know that we're getting ready to move into a, a bowling alley, and we're wanting to establish a good relationship in our community with the city and everything. We're looking for zoning and stuff like that, and right in the middle of that, I get asked to, to come to, to that kind of thing. And again, I don't know if God's going to do anything with that at all, but I remember I was just standing on the Senate floor going, man, God can put anybody anywhere he wants to at any given time. He can take people who don't have any knowledge or wisdom or power of any kind and he can put them in places of great authority and he can take places of people with great authority and power and he can make them nothing. Everything falls under his power and his authority. And here's the beauty. He's working it all together for not just good, but the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now you might sit and look at that and go, okay, so, but what does that look like? Like, how does that, how does that even work? Because you might be thinking, well, if God's already got the plan, like, kind of what's my role in the plan? Well, here's, here, here's where we get deep. Here's how God works, and this is why God is so much different than we are. This is what he says. He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Now, I would encourage you to think, for sure, but don't overthink this. Sometimes we get a little too smart for this passage. This is saying something very simple. He's saying, for those God foreknew, for those God, he knew in advance, and, and with you, God foreknew your life. He knew every decision that you would ever make. He knew whether the people in this room would make a decision to believe in him or people would make a decision to not believe in him. He knew that. That is the foreknowledge that he contains. That was your choice. He just... He just knew it before time even began. Those he foreknew, or those who he knew that would make a choice to follow him, he predestined. Really, again, very simple. Because he knew what choice you were going to make, he then came up with a plan. I just want you to think about it for a second. How would your plans change if you had foreknowledge? Just think about it. Oh, yeah, that'd be great, wouldn't it? Just think about it. It's just simple things. Like, if you knew everything that was going to happen before it happened... Like, that would probably change the way you do your money, right? You invest your money. Like, it just, you could go for long shots in football games, right? You could be like, I'm going to take somebody that doesn't have a prayer at winning, somebody like the Lions against the Packers, you know? I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's not even football season. I'm, I'm going to take a long shot, right? And somebody that has no chance. And when you took that long shot, what would everybody else do? 
Everybody else would be like, you're crazy. You're cra There's no way. That is the dumbest thing you can possibly do. But by the end of the year, you'd be a billionaire if you had foreknowledge. And everybody else would think you were nuts. If you had foreknowledge, it would ma help you make decisions. <laughs> like some of you, like when you're thinking about having a kid, how do you make that decision? You're like, well, do we have enough money? And is the marriage good? And, and can we do this, right? Is this the right time? But if you had foreknowledge, man, you'd actually be looking at the way your kids turn out. And so you, you'd be, like, before you even had a kid, you'd be like, uh, when my kid's 40, he's, like, at a Renaissance Festival LARPing, like, <laughs> no thanks. And you'd be like, well, we don't have kids. Or you might be able to look at your kid's life and be like, yeah, they're, uh, my, my kids turn out to be a psychopath. I mean, that's just the way it is. And, and so people be like, why don't you have kids? And be like, our kids turn out to be psychopaths. So, uh. <laughs> So we aren't having kids, right? That would be the only reason that you need. And everything, just, just get lost in how different your life would be and how different your plans would be if you knew, if you knew the decisions that would lead there. God does that. He, he has foreknowledge. And based on the decisions of every person on earth, he comes up with a plan. He predestines those to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what you've been predestined to, to become like his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he called, he predestined. He also called, those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So again, this is your, your choice and your decision. God knows it in advance, and he comes up with a plan that you're a part of. And again, just to bring us back, the, the purpose of the plan is to work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, you might be sitting out there going, boy, that, uh, I'm not really sure how that works. I actually want to give you kind of a terrifying example. It's not my, my idea. It actually comes from the book of Romans. Paul gives this as an example. He says this, Romans 9, 17. He says, for scripture says to Pharaoh, Pharaoh of Egypt, Moses, Egypt, he says, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So when God freed his people from Egypt, he had two purposes. One, to make sure that everybody knew that he was God, that he was the real God, that he had authority and he had power and he was legit. That was objective number one. Objective number two is so that he, everybody would know that the Israelites were his people. They were his people and they were called by his name. That's the objective. Now this, to me, gets a little scary. Because of all the parts in scripture that are kind of big, hairy, scary stories, this one to me uh, causes me to tremble the most. Here's how the story goes for Pharaoh. God goes and he's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour out my wrath on Egypt so that everybody would know that I am the real God and I have real power and authority and people might talk about me all over the earth and that they might know that the Israelites or my people are called by my name. So I'm, in order to do that, I'm going to pour out my wrath on Egypt. So he goes to Pharaoh and he dumps out ten plagues. Now this is how the plagues turn out. Listen to Pharaoh's interaction with God. The first plague, God turns water into blood. Pharaoh looks at that. There was a shock wave. Everybody looks around. They're like, our, our water sources have all become blood. But then it clears off. And it says in the book of Exodus that Pharaoh hardened his heart and he would not let God's people go. So Pharaoh made that decision. He said, nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let these slaves go just because of this one event. So God comes back around. He sends the next plague, the plague of frogs, frogs everywhere. Pharaoh sees the devastation that these frogs cause. And again, Pharaoh says he hardened his heart and he would not let the people go. The next plague came along, and it was gnats, and gnats filled the entire nation of Egypt. It was everywhere. I don't know if you've ever been riding your bike and ran into a swarm of gnats, but it was like more than that, because it was like everywhere. People were literally inhaling and exhaling gnats, and Pharaoh saw this, but he hardened his heart, and he would not let God's people go. Then God sent the plague of flies. And the flies filled the entire land. 
And Pharaoh saw the devastation that that caused, and everybody was asking him, what are we going to do? And it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart, and he would not let God's people go. And then God sent the death of livestock, and God moved into Egypt and killed all of the Egyptian livestock. All of the Egyptian livestock just gone. And then they looked over, and the Israelites, all their livestock was still alive. And Pharaoh saw that. And he still hardened his heart. And he says, no, no, no. I'm not going to let these people go. I am not going to be intimidated by the God of slaves. No. And he hardened his heart. And then things changed a little bit. That's the first five plagues. The next five plagues are what caused me uh, to a little be a little scared. Here's what happened. The boils came. And the boils broke out all over the skin of everybody that lived in Egypt, not on the Israelites, but the people in Egypt. And here's what it says. Language changes. It says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The first five plagues, Pharaoh did that all on his own. He hardened his heart. But here's what I believe. I believe that Pharaoh was done. I believe he looked at all the devastation that had been caused. He looked at all of his people begging him for mercy, and he would have tapped out, and he would have said, forget it. I'm not going to destroy my people. I'm not going to destroy myself for the sake of our slaves. Get out of here. And God said, no, 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 no. You get back here. I know what's in your heart. I know who you are. I've got a purpose, and I've got a plan, and guess what, buddy? You're a part of it. You get back here. And God hardened Pharaoh's heart. He says, listen to me, I've got an override button on your free will, and here it is. You're going to do what I tell you to do. And so God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let his people go, and he sent five more plagues. And all the time, it says that God hardened his heart. And God poured out his wrath on Egypt so that his name would be proclaimed on the earth, and everybody would know that the Israelites were his people and that were called by his name. And then Paul says something kind of terrifying in Romans 9. He says, therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. And when I think about that, that causes me to tremble a little bit. That there are people out there in the world who have no idea that God has made those decisions for them. There are people out there in the world who are convinced who are solid in what they are doing, but they don't even realize that God has come in and he is making decisions for some people. Now you might sit back and go, wow, I, well, if, if God's making all the decisions, then what's the purpose? If God already has a plan, what's our role in this whole thing? Well, don't get lost. Don't get lost. You still have a choice. God has made the choice for you. God isn't making the choice for you. He's given you that choice. He just knows what that choice is in advance, and he's made it a part of his plan. Here's what Paul says. He continues on. He says, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? In other words, well, if God's got the whole plan and we're not even a part of it, he's like, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. God, why does God still hold us accountable? For who is able to resist his will? But who are you? A human being to talk back to God. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out, out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if, and I think this is a what if statement. I don't think Paul's saying, hey, I know how it all works. I think he's saying, what if this? What if, what if, what if God Although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction. What if just in the same way God looked in the heart of everybody that, that he knew would call, uh, respond to him and choose him? What if he looked at everybody that he knew would not respond to him and he carefully, meticulously planned them as, as purpose for his wrath and destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy, whom he prepared in advance for glory, even us whom he has called? Now, when I read that, I go, wow. I think sometimes that I got it all figured out. I think that I know what's happening. But at the end of the day, none of that really matters. Here's what matters. 
I want to be an object of his mercy. I want to be an object of his mercy. And all he said for me to do is to believe in him and to follow after him. That choice is mine. That choice is yours. And at the end of the day, everybody on earth has, has two choices. They can either be called or they can be commandeered. They can be called, and they can be called according to his purpose, and God's like, hey, yeah, you fall in with my plan, that's fantastic, I'll put you in this piece of plan, and I'm going to work all things together for your good, may not always feel like his good, but it's for your good, or he's going to take hold of you, and he's going to use you to literally serve his plan, which is to work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That choice is yours. That choice, that, that is God's mercy that he would allow you to make that decision. And just because God knows what that decision is going to be even before it happens doesn't mean that it's any less your decision to make. So I would challenge you to do this, that you would humble yourself before his mighty hand. That again, you would come and recognize his just absolute control, authority, and supremacy. Humble yourself before him and say, I will follow you wherever you want me to go. I will be obedient to whatever you want me to do. And this passage then becomes the most comforting passage in scripture. Again, let me read it one more time. And we, all, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is literally moving heaven and earth for you. Everything. This election that's coming up, we all think that that's like about America. We think it's about border security and transgender bathrooms and just a whole bunch of stuff. That's what we think that this election is about. And this election is about what it's been about since the beginning of time. It has been about God working his plan, having his plan, and working his plan, and working everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. There is literally nothing that is outside of God's contact to bring under, under his control and under his supremacy to work together for, for this group of people. And if you feel weak, and there's times where, man, you feel like you're the only Christian at the place where you work, or you're the only follower of Christ in your family. Just remember, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And if you feel outnumbered and you feel like an outcast and you don't feel like you can keep going, just remember that God is working everything together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Let me pray for you.